again, it's Lock Noob, and today I thought we'd see how wafer locks work on the inside. We see wafer locks all the time, car doors, filing cabinet locks, and such like. But this is a disassembled, or not even assembled actually, padlock sent to me by Leon's Lock Pad. Please go check him out. Uh, Leon is a great guy, has a fantastic YouTube channel, he's a brilliant picker. The, I think the best way to understand how a lock works is to see it being made. And you might be thinking, wafer padlocks? Do, do we even use wafer padlocks anymore? Well, yeah, you might be thinking of things like these mid-century uh, padlocks. As beautiful as they are, they are wafer locks. And this is, yes, a brand new wafer lock made by Asa Abloy. Oh, it's a Lockwood one. So yeah, they are used still. Why would you use a wafer padlock? Well, usually for low security applications, I've seen them on all sorts of things like uh, fuse box cupboards and such like in, in various uh, office buildings. Anyway, enough about the where they're used. Let's actually have a look at making this lock. And hopefully for those of you who are only familiar with pin tumblers, you'll have a better idea of the differences. So you can see this is a zero bitted key. You can get uh, wafers which have different cut depths in, and that would mean that you can have different bittings on the key, much like the ones over here. You can see they look just like pin tumbler keys, and in some ways they work just the same. Apart from they don't have drivers, they really just work off the interaction between the wafer and the key itself. Now, this has been partially assembled, ready to go, but what I want to do is just fully disassemble it for you to show you what we have. So this here is just a spring and a shackle locking pawl. You can see a little notch there. What does that notch interact with? It interacts with the shackle itself. So when it's locked here, it will be fully, when it's in engaging here, should I say, it's going to be fully locked down. When it's moved to the left in this instance, a spring will force this up and then it'll catch again at this point and then it won't do any more movement. It won't pull out. It'll just be able to swing around at the top of the padlock. You'll see that a bit better later on. Now, interestingly, you'll see that you have a slope here and a slope there. These th That means that you can push the shackle down and that'll push the pull out of the way, allowing it to lock the padlock back up just by pushing the shackle in. So it isn't double locking, that isn't two of these locking pulls uh, with springs in alternate directions. Where is the spring? Well, it's down here, as you can see. So we just tip that out, and this will be quite a strong steel spring to provide a little bit of push from here. So if I put these together, you'll easily see how that locking pawl interacts with the shackle and how the shackle is pushed up by the spring. The body itself isn't anything too special. Um, it's very cool. But what I like about it is that once you've assembled this, you can put on this face plate, press it down, and once it's pressed in, it'll be incredibly hard to remove. Not saying it won't be possible to remove it, but the fact is, like all wafer padlocks, it'd probably be easier to pick it or snap the shackle than it would be to actually take this plate off once it's pressed in fully. Is this plate anything other than a way to assemble the lock and something that looks nice and shiny? Yes, actually, it has a function as well, which I'll we'll come on to in a minute, which is this part, this little prong, which engages inside the lock for a very specific purpose. Then we have the core. The core takes wafers, and the wafers are sprung. I actually have some of the tiny, teeny, weeny little springs here. And the springs go down these holes. There you go. The wafers would then be inserted into the core, and you can see how the little lug at the side would once the wafer's been pressed in, it will engage with a spring, forcing the wafers up. 
for now, let's just leave that to one side and let's put the core inside the padlock. And you can see that what you've got inside is a little notch at the top. So you can imagine if those wafers are sticking up, they will stick up into this notch, which is here. Let me get a pick and show you. So they'll be here. They'll actually dig in at the top here. And that means it can't turn. You also got to retract the wafers below this shear line here, and that will allow the core to turn. So imagine those wafers are in there, but it keeps falling out. Hmm, well that wouldn't be very much use, would it, if, if you pick it and it just keeps falling out? Well, you'll notice another type of wafer, and this is a control wafer, and this is sprung, and you can, uh, if you're unlucky, pick it, but it doesn't actually go down very far. And this would sit sprung here, and when that's actually in the lock, and it isn't on sp in spring tension, so I'll just allow it to go in, you'll see that when it's on spring tension, it'll fall down, there you go, and actually stop the whole thing from coming out. If you accidentally pick one of these control wafers, say in a filing cabinet, um, then, <laughs> yeah, the, the whole core will come out. Why would you do that? Well, these can be easily rekeyed if somebody loses their key, allowing you to uh, use a control key, which depresses the control wafer, allowing the core to come back out and allowing you to service or replace the wafers in the lock. That's how they usually work anyway. Uh, anything else of interest in this um, core? Well, yes, this bit here, this is the actuator. And what that would do is it would engage here on the locking pole and as it turns it will force it either left or right depending on the way it's turned actually that's a lie it would always force it to the left just because of the way that it's held in the lock I can show you just by inserting it really it might be a bit a bit better for you so let me just push this in the core in. There we go. And you'll see that if I put this key in and I just hold the lock there and turn, you'll see how it slides it left and right. With the faceplate on, this won't come out. With it off, it torques this out like that, which isn't obviously very useful. But I'll put that back in for now. Right. I say what we do is we put these wafers into this core and see what it looks like then and see what it looks like when I insert the key. I might speed this bit up. Okay, there we are. Now, with this lock, and <laughs> actually it's a good feature, not all wave locks have this, each of these wafers has a very, 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 very small uh, nubbin, if you like, a little uh, nipple that comes out on the side, which clicks into a ledge within the core, meaning they don't actually just jump out. You can push them out using a little screwdriver from the bottom. But you can see that these naturally sit outside of the core itself. What you want them to do is retract as you put the key in, depending on the bitting of the key and the wafers inserted. So if I push this in, you'll see that this key not only uh, pulls the wafers down, but it pushes them out too far. That's because this key hasn't been cut 
for the correct bitting of these wafers, which all have different uh, depths. So the key can go in, but all that would do is force the wafers out to the other side and block the keyway. Yep, that's right. If you look inside here, you actually have two ledges or cutouts for the wafers to engage with, depending on whether they are sat at rest or picked too high and therefore they will be pushed down to the bottom and blocked from the bottom of the keyway. So yes, you can have wafers uh, stopping you from turning the core because they're engaging both at the top and the bottom of the keyway. Pretty cool. What you'll see is I haven't put in the control wafer yet, but why not? And there we are. So the trick is, is to slide this into the lock, probably using a shim, and then that will engage with the, the actuator will engage with the locking port at the end. The control wafer will stop the core from falling back out and we're almost there. Right, before we do that final bit of assembly, I do want to draw your attention to a bit of an issue that we have with the lock at the moment in this state. So let me just pull that pull back, put the spring in, pull it back a bit more so the spring can go down. There we go. Put the shackle in. And that, that should just need a, a gentle push because there we go. It's ready to go, it's all locked in now. That would be all fine apart from one thing. When we actually unlock it, the whole shackle comes out. I mean, that's not very useful, is it? Even if the locking pole hasn't been pushed too far to the left. How do we stop that from happening? Well, what we have is this prong on the faceplate, and that actually goes down this little groove on the inside. Here it is, this little groove here. And that prong going down that groove essentially engages with the shackle at this point, just like that. So it can go up and down, but only that far. Very cool feature. All right, let's do our final bit of assembly and see how it all looks together. And there we are. So this key will not now open this lock because what, what will happen is the wafers are being pushed too far down into the keyway and blocking the keyway from the bottom now. If I lock this up and open it, then this whole thing would shoot off. So what I'm going to do is just gently engage this a tiny bit, just push it with my fingers, leaving a nice big gap there. So I don't want to um, force this. And there we are. This is now a locked Lockwood padlock. So how do I go about picking it? Well, uh, we only have the wafers to push one way, which is up if we turn the lock like this. I'd use 
a sturdy tension tool. I like using this wire one because it fits nicely in the keyway, not too much slop. And raking is always a good option for wafer locks, but use a well-rounded rake. Wafers can be a bit fragile and you can damage them, warping them, meaning that they don't move up and down in the same way and essentially ruining the lock. And with this, I just insert the, the rake and just do a gentle raking until, there we go, we've got an open. To single pin pick it, or in this case actually single wafer picking it. I'd use the same technique, but I'd probably use a sturdy pick and use a little bit of firm tension on this. And just go in with the pick put some firm tension on and oh, it looks like I've actually picked it by inserting the pick itself. That is how easy wave locks can be to do. Let's try that again and uh, I'll try to make sure I don't pick it straight away. There you go. Um, That's it, five, four's fine, three, two, oh, and we're open, there we go. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? You insert the pick and it just opens, um, then you try to pick it and it just resists you that little bit, but there you go. Um, why is this front coming off? It's because I haven't pushed it down far enough and what's happening here is the actuator is actually camming out the pawn instead of um, pulling it to one side. But like I said, what I don't want to do is put this lovely faceplate on uh, and permanently lock down this lock because I think it's a really nice lock to demonstrate. If we wanted to uh, release this, all we need to do is to just use a pick or something to push in that master wafer and then that core would actually free itself completely then and drop back out. Anyway, thank you Leon's Lockpad for sending this brilliant sort of self-assembly Lockwood wafer padlock. I've had a lot of fun exploring this. I hope that a few of you have learned a little bit about wave locks and how they work, um, especially in the context of such a cool little lock. All right, I'll see you all next time.